Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. What a privilege it is to be here with you in beautiful Cape Town. This is my very first visit to Cape Town, and um, I'm amazed by the beauty. Yesterday, we got to go to the top of Table Mountain and see the view of the city, and I tell you, you're blessed in Jesus' name. Uh, Evangelist Bonke, thank you so much for that kind introduction. The only problem with an introduction like that is now I have to live up to it. But by the grace of God, we will do these things in greater in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I, I just sense the presence of the Lord here this morning. I don't know if, if you can sense it. Let's just take a moment, can we? Let's just bow our heads in the presence of the Lord. Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit that's hovering over this place even right now. Lord, I thank you that you are longing to move in this place and to pour out your Spirit and to impart your fire and your anointing to us. Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this house. We welcome your gifts. We welcome your anointing. We welcome your outpouring. We welcome your power in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Right now, I just sense the Holy Spirit telling me to do this, and I want to be obedient. If you have sickness in your body, I want you to stand right now in Jesus' name. Right where you stand, the Lord is going to touch you and heal you. Just stretch your hands out if you need healing this morning. Father, I pray for each and every one of these precious people that are standing here. And in Jesus' name, right now, I release the healing power of the Holy Spirit into each body. I rebuke every sickness and every disease and every pain in Jesus' name. I say especially right now to cancer, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. And I command cancer to wither and to die and to disappear in the name of Jesus. And I speak to your body to receive its healing now in the name of Jesus. I rebuke every spirit of infirmity and every spirit of sickness. I tell you to come out in Jesus' name. And I pray that the, the blood and the stripes of Jesus would impart healing to your body right now. Just receive it in Jesus' name. By faith, receive it right now in Jesus' name. Receive, receive, receive in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. You can be seated. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles, uh, open them up to the book of Hebrews this morning. I'm not going to preach for a long time. But I have something on my heart, and I believe that this week these services are more than just another church service more than just another conference, more than just another preach or another worship time. This week is a divine pivot point in your life. This week you will encounter the presence of God in a way that will transform you and change you forever. I believe that this week the Lord will, will change your course and will propel you into greater things and to higher heights, and to deeper depths, in Jesus' name. If you are in the ministry here, get ready for your ministry to go to a new place. Get ready for your giftings and your anointing to go deeper than ever before. If you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, be prepared for an outpouring of the Holy Ghost right here in this place. I want to preach to you from the book of Hebrews chapter 11. I'm going to begin reading at, at verse 32. Hebrews 11 is uh, a chapter that lists the names and the stories of great men in God throughout history. Men who did great and mighty deeds for the Lord. These are people that we may look at and say, I would like to be like them one day. I would like to model my life after them one, like, like them one day. It's been known as the Hall of Fame of Faith. How many of you have ever heard that terminology given to it? 
the hall of fame of faith, Hebrews 11. As I was reading through these passages and, and reading the stories of these men, I came to a conclusion that that title, the hall of fame of faith, is simply too weak for these great men of God. And so I decided to give it my own title. Is that okay? Can I get kicked out of Cape Town for doing that this morning? I want to tell you what I've decided to call Hebrews chapter 11. I call it the league of dangerous men. I'm going to begin reading in verse 32. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah and of David also and of Samuel and of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again, and on and on it goes. How many would say these are some mighty men and women? These are some great men and women. And I want to be like them. I want to aspire to the greatness that they achieved in their lifetimes. When you first read these names, you might think to yourself, this must be a list of the most perfect men and women who ever walked the face of the earth. These people must have been lily white. They must have never done anything wrong in their lives. Is there anybody here this morning who thinks that? Oh, I'm so glad you didn't lift your hands. This list of, of people you may be surprised to know contains the names of some really rotten people. In this list you'll find murderers. You'll find adulterers. You'll find liars. You'll find cheaters. You'll find thieves. You'll even find someone here who committed human sacrifice. And then once you have the revelation that these people weren't so perfect, that actually their pasts are full of of skeletons and, and stains and sins, then you might wonder the second question, which is, how is it that God was able to use them? My friends, let me tell you something. If you have that question in your mind, it's because of a mixed conception that some people have that the reason that God uses people is because of, of holiness. And my friend, listen, holiness has its own reward. The Bible says that without holiness, no man will see the Lord. How many would say that's a motivation? Jesus said in the scripture that some will come to him on the last day and say to him, Lord, Lord, haven't we cast out demons in your name? And haven't we healed the sick in your name? And what will he say to them? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. You see, holiness has its reward. And it's necessary and it's right but holiness is, does not guarantee that God is going to use you. And holiness does not guarantee that you're going to be greatly used and dangerously used by God. There's one quality that all of these people had that made them usable by God. How many of you want to know what it is? One word, faith. There were men and women of faith. There were men and women who were willing to take a risk for God. They were men and women who were willing to step out of the boat. They were people who were willing to put their lives and their reputations on the line for this God that they worshipped and served because they considered Him worthy of their devotion and worthy of their honor and worthy of their faith. Say amen. amen. As I read through the Bible, I've made a discovery that the Bible is full of stories about these people full of faith. I'm calling them dangerous people. In fact, let me, let me make it a little bit more uh, graphic for you this morning. The Bible is full of stories about crazy people. Think about some of the stories that we've heard maybe since we were children and we've come to take these stories for granted. But if you think about it, you'll discover that these were all crazy people. Think about David, this little shepherd boy. He goes out into the field of battle, and there he sees a giant professional warrior. 
Nine feet tall. I don't know what that is in, in the metric system. Nine feet tall. From head to toe, he's wearing armor. In one hand, he has a spear. In the other hand, he has a shield. On his waist, he wears a sword. He is the champion of the Philistine army. And here's David. What is he armed with? A piece of leather and a rock. He's crazy. Think about Noah, this old, this old man building this gigantic boat, bigger this, than this entire room. It's never rained before in history. They're nowhere near a body of water. Think about this. And he's building this massive boat. And everyone who passes by, old Noah calls down to them and he says, you better repent. There's going to be a flood. Water is going to fall from the sky and flood the earth. People look at him and they say, oh, that old Noah, he's crazy. Think about Peter in the boat, in the middle of the sea, in the middle of a hurricane. He can't quite see the, who it is that's walking on the water, but he thinks that it sounds something like Jesus. And so the Bible says that, he says, Lord, if it is you, then call me to come to you on the water. And then one, one word comes back in reply. Jesus didn't say, Peter, yes, it is me. In fact, I want to prove it to you. Come walk on the water. No. There was just one word, come. Peter, if it was me, I would have said, okay, I heard Jesus' voice. That's good enough. But no, Peter, he steps out of the boat and tries to walk on the water. He's crazy. Think about Moses another shepherd from the wilderness. He goes to the most powerful king in the world, walks right into his throne room, surrounded by his royal guards. He points his bony finger in the king's face and says, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, let my people go. He's telling Pharaoh to let the source of his country's economic prosperity walk out his back door without any compensation. He's crazy. But how many of you know this morning that God uses crazy people? God loves crazy people. You know, some of the places where, where the CFAN team goes to preach, I've had people tell me to my face, they've said, Daniel, you're crazy. I say, I'm in good company. Because Jesus loves crazy people. Jesus uses crazy people. I tell you, if there's anybody here this morning that would get just a little bit crazy for Jesus, you would find that he shows up for you. That he works for you. That he uses you to do great and mighty things. It's what we taught, heard Evangelist Bonke preaching about this morning. Some of, some of you have never seen God's power in your life because you've never given the Lord a chance to work through you. I had one young man, he said to me, how is it that overseas people are raised from the dead all the time? But he said, I've never seen someone raised from the dead. I said, when's the last time you prayed for a dead person? He said, never. I said, that's why. Everybody wants, everybody wants to see the cripple get out of the wheelchair. But nobody wants to be the fool that takes him by the hand and pulls him out. That's too crazy for us. Everybody wants a testimony, but nobody wants the test that goes with the testimony. If you would get just a little bit crazy for Jesus, if you would put your trust and your faith in Him, if you would do something dangerous for His glory, He will not fail you, but He will show up for you. Somebody say amen. In the Bible, all the people that we read about are the ones that went out and did something. There's no stories about the one who stayed home and sat on his couch eating potato chips and watching Oprah. You guys watch Oprah out here too, huh? Look at the story of the, tw of the spies that went into the promised land. We don't even know who most of the spies were. Only two, Joshua and Caleb. The two that were crazy, we know. The two that were willing to trust God, we know. The others, they don't even get an honorable mention. God uses crazy people. Amen. 
Let's keep reading here. Skip down to verse number 39. It says, And all of these having obtained a good report through what? Through faith. They received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they, without us, should not be made perfect. Now let me put this into modern language. It's actually amazing what this verse is saying. The writer of Hebrews is saying that God, in his infinite wisdom, has orchestrated history in such a way that all of these great men and women of God who we read about, the Joshuas, the Calebs, the Samsons, the Jephthahs, the prophets, the priests, the kings, all of these ones who we look at and put on such a high pedestal, the author is saying that these great men and women of God are looking to you. They're looking to you. They're, they're looking to you because they have hope in you. And maybe this morning you say, what could they possibly be looking to me for? I'm just an average, ordinary person. I'm not a great man or woman of God that Scripture was written by or written about. I'm just an average person. Let me tell you why they're interested. Keep reading down into the first verse of chapter 12. It says, Therefore, seeing that we are also encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race set before us. The author is describing for us a picture that is unmistakable. You see, in his time, he is describing what was the most popular athletic sport. Today, it would be the sport of football. But in his day, it was foot racing. And here the author says that there is a great stadium. And the stadium is packed with spectators. He calls it a great cloud of witnesses. And all of these spectators are looking down at the track below with eager anticipation. And what are they looking to? What are they looking at? All of these great men and women of God from generations gone by. There in the bleachers is the league of dangerous men from generations ago. What are they looking for? What are they interested in? My friends, it's you and it's me. And why are they interested in us? Well, it's not because we're so beautiful, even though you are very beautiful this morning. It's not because we're so intelligent. It's not because we have such great technology. It's not because we're so educated or sophisticated or indoctrinated. There's one reason they're interested in us. It's because of what we hold in our hands. You see, in our hands is a baton that has been passed down throughout the generations. Moses passed it down to Joshua. Elijah passed it down to Elisha. Jesus gave it to his disciples. The disciples gave it to the church fathers. And through the centuries, through the millenniums of this world, the baton of the gospel has come down and now it rests in the hands of this generation. And may I also say that when I say this generation, I'm not just talking about the young people. Because if you're still breathing oxygen right now, that means God is not done with you yet. You are still a part of this generation. And it is yet to be seen what God will do through your life. In Jesus' name. Our generation now holds the baton of the gospel. And the reason that generations of mighty men are looking to us is because they know something that so often we forget. If we cross the finish line now, if we win the race, if we reap the harvest, they all win. Every sermon they preached was not in vain. Every book they wrote was not in vain. 
Every tear they cried, every martyr's drop of blood was not in vain if we win now. But they know something else. If we stumble and fall, if we decide we're too tired and we take a break on the side of the road, if we lay down the baton in the pursuit of worldly pleasures or comforts or conveniences, if we lose the race now, they all lose. That's why they're looking to us. And that's why we're looking to Him. Say amen. amen. In every generation, I'm convinced that the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the earth. What is He searching for? The best looking person? Afraid not. The most educated person? Sorry. He's looking for men and women who are dangerous. Who are willing to trust him. Who are willing to put their lives in his hands. I love reading the stories about some of these people. They, they inspire me. One of my favorite uh, of these men is, is a guy by the name of Smith Wigglesworth. How many of you have ever heard that funny name? Smith Wigglesworth, a crazy guy. He was not a polished professional Bible college educated preacher. He was just an old plumber. In fact, he said when he would get up to talk to people, he would begin to stutter and he would begin to perspire and he would begin to shake. He was so nervous. He was so insecure in himself. He couldn't even talk in front of a crowd. And then something happened to old Smith. Something that's going to happen to you here tomorrow morning. The Holy Spirit came upon him and filled him with fire. And that stuttering, stamming, stammering plumber became a firebrand evangelist for Jesus. Even though he was anointed and called, he still had some of his bad habits, his unpolished ways, in fact, people said that sometimes in the prayer lines, he was infamous for punching people. You see, when he saw someone who was suffering under the, the curse of the, of the devil, he would become so angry at the devil that he just couldn't control himself. He would punch the person. And one time someone asked Smith, they said, why is it that you hit people so much when you pray for them? And he says, what? I don't hit people. I hit the devil and people get in my way. <laughs> One day the story is that he was in a church and he was walking down the, the prayer line and he was praying for people and he was behaving himself. It was a good day. And then suddenly he came upon a man who had a tumor protruding out of his belly. And when, when Smith saw how this man was, was, was suffering under this sickness, he, this righteous indignation began to boil on the inside of him. And he couldn't control himself. He pulled back his old plumber fist and he punched that guy right in the stomach. Well, the guy fell on the ground. His doctor had come with him. He, he examined him and then shouted to Smith Wigglesworth who was already praying for other people. He said, you've killed this man. We're going to sue you. Well, Smith wasn't even phased by it. He just kept praying and shouted over his shoulder and said, Don't worry, he's healed. And he kept praying. A few minutes later, that man got up off the ground. The tumor gone, the cancer gone, completely and totally healed. <laughs> How many know that's dangerous? You may be thankful to know that Smith is not praying for the sick here this morning. The story is told that one day he was standing at a bus stop waiting for the bus to come and he saw a little grandma that had come all the way from her house and she turned and noticed that, that her small pet puppy dog had followed her all the way from the house. Now, I think that that grandma must have been from South Africa because she was very sweet. I've heard there's very sweet grandmas in South Africa. When she saw that dog, the sweet grandmotherly voice, began to talk and say, now go home now. 
that you can't come on the bus with grandma. You've got to run home. And she kept trying to convince that dog to go home. And the whole time, the dog just sat there wagging its tail like this. <laughs> just enjoying grandma's sweet voice. And Smith said he watched this for several minutes. And he watched how this sweet grandma suddenly transformed before his eyes. How many know that even sweet grandmothers can get fed up sometimes? And suddenly that grandma looked at that puppy dog, stomped her foot on the ground and said, Go home at once! And that little dog turned around, tucked its tail between its legs, and ran home as fast as it could. And Smith Wigglesworth, sitting at the bus stop, began to laugh out loud and he said, Now that's how you have to deal with the devil. I wonder if there's somebody here this morning that's going to come to a place where you're going to stop sweet-talking the devil and you're going to tell him to get out of your life. Smith Wigglesworth was a dangerous man. Say amen. There's another one that you may know well being in South Africa, a man by the name of John G. Lake, another dangerous man. When he arrived here in South Africa, there was a terrible plague sweeping through the land. And they said bodies were lying in the streets because the disease was so contagious, no one wanted to touch those bodies. And I'm sure most of you know the story. A scientist that was there trying to find a cure for the disease saw how John G. Lake and his other associates were burying these bodies. And they weren't wearing masks. They weren't wearing gloves. And the scientist said... Pastor John, explain to me how you're able to do this without getting sick and without contracting this disease. John said, take a sample of that virus and put it in the palm of my hand. The scientist did as he was instructed to do. And then John G. Lake said, now I want you to look at it again. The man scraped the sample off of John's hand, put it under the microscope and looked through the viewfinder and gasped at what he saw. That virus had instantly died in the palm of John G. Lake's hand. The scientist said, how did you do this? What is your secret? I think he was trying to find a, a, a medical explanation, but he was to get no medical explanation. The only explanation that John G. Lake gave to the scientist was the words from Romans chapter 8 verse 2. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and of death. Say amen. amen. John Lake was a dangerous man. John Wesley was a dangerous man. Now if you lived in John Wesley's town, every morning... At five o'clock in the morning, you would hear his voice as he stood on the street corner preaching to the miners and the people walking to work in the early morning hours. Every morning he would do this. Most days he would preach four or five times on the streets. He didn't have a beautiful pulpit like this. You know, I, I've heard people say, I'm called to evangelism, but no one will give me a pulpit my friends, what are you talking about? Every street corner is a pulpit. Your next door neighbor is your congregation. Many of you have family members that have yet to be saved. Don't tell me you don't have an audience. Every day he would preach four or five times on the streets. And he even did this on his wedding day and on his honeymoon. I would never have gotten away with that. But he considered it his sacred duty and obligation to preach the gospel to anyone who would listen to him. And he did it all of his life. Thousands and thousands of times he preached the gospel. John Wesley was a dangerous man. John Hyde was another one. John Hyde was a missionary to India. When he arrived there in India, he was so burdened with the condition of the Indian people and he didn't know how to reach them. So they said that often he would lock himself away in a room for sometimes 30 days at one time. 
just weeping and praying, burdened for the salvation of those Indian people. In his 40s, still as a young man, his health began to deteriorate and he went to Calcutta to see a doctor. When the doctor took a look at him, he made a startling discovery. John Hyde's heart had shifted in his chest because of those years of fervent, intense prayer and intercession for the salvation of the Indian people. So intense was his prayer life that the Indians nicknamed him John Praying Hyde. Today there's a great move of God happening on the continent of India. The whole subcontinent is, is seeing a, a wave of salvation and the power of God that is unique to our time. And I believe it's because of men like John Prang Hyde that gave all they had to see people saved. Say amen. amen. Now, all of these men, as wonderful as they were, they all have one problem this morning. How many of you want to know what it is? They're all gone. They're all gone. John Hyde will never intercede for souls again. They're all saved up there. John Wesley will never preach the gospel again. There's no lost people in heaven. John G. Lake will never lay hands on the sick again. There's no sick people up there. Smith Wigglesworth will never cast out demons again. There's no demons up there. They're all gone. And now, my friends, the eyes of the Lord are going to and fro throughout the whole earth again. And now he is searching for some new members of that league of dangerous men. Who can he use in our time? Who can he raise up in our generation? Who will heal the sick? Who will cast out the demons? Who will preach the gospel? Who will pour out their soul in intercession? My friends, listen. The only ones that God has this morning is you and me. If we don't go, no one will go. If we don't preach, no one will preach. If not here, where? If not now, when? If not us, who? This is our time. Say amen. amen. You know, there's some people, they think that the great need of God in our time is for more money. I hope I don't step on anybody's toes. But I, I always hear preachers preaching about money. And sometimes I, I begin to wonder if they think that God is a pauper. The way that some people talk, you'd think that, that God just needs some money so he can get through the day. My friends, we need money, it's true. But let me tell you what the book of Haggai chapter 2 verse 8 says. God says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine. Just in case you were wondering. No, my friends, the great need of God this morning is not for money. There's some people, they think that God's great need is for monuments. So they build him these gigantic cathedrals, these, these huge memorials. I was in London a few months ago and I was visiting some historical sites and I went to this one cathedral. It cost 20 pounds just to walk into the cathedral. It was no longer used as a place of worship. It was a museum. And this is what it said on the door. It says, this is the entrance to the house of God, the very gate of heaven. I thought to myself, is that true? Does God now live in a museum? No, my friends, listen to what Isaiah says in, in chapter 55, verse 8. He says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you can build for me? Tell me. Can you build a building that great and that vast? My friend, listen. The great need of God this morning is not for monuments. There's others they think that God's greatest need is for modern methods. 
They write books about it. They hold conferences about it. If we can just teach God how to get a little bit more modern so he can appeal to the new generation, then we'll be effective. What God really needs is some pyrotechnics. What God really needs is, is to dress a little bit younger. Needs a little bit more modern music. That's what God needs. If he could just get that down. But this is what he says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 66, verse 1. He says, my ways are not your ways. And my thoughts are not your thoughts. My friend, listen, I, I received my call into the ministry. And I was transformed not by pyrotechnics and not by a, a Christian rock band and not by the most modern, sophisticated kind of a service. I was transformed by an encounter with the power of the Holy Spirit that has haunted my every waking moment. And I tell you what our generation needs is not to be more modern. They need Jesus. They need the real and the living Jesus. No, my friends, the great need of God in our time is not for modern methods. And it's not for massive monuments. And it's not for mountains of money. But there is something that God needs. There is something He's searching for this morning. There is something he is longing for. It's for more men and more women whom he can use and who will trust him and who will put their faith and their hope in him. I wonder if there's any dangerous people here this morning. I'm almost done. I want to, I want to mention a couple more things. Turn to the book of Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. This is the story of the call of Gideon. The background of the story is that the children of Israel were being harassed by an aggressive Gentile nation called the Midianites. Midian was very cruel to Israel. The Midianite soldiers would come down in raids into the Israelite villages. They would burn the cities. They would rape the women. They would steal the valuables. And they would leave them hungry and destitute. They would ride off. Israel was afraid of Midian. And Gideon, being a, a one of the Israelites, was also afraid. So afraid, in fact, that he was threshing his wheat in a wine press. Now, I'm not a farmer, and I'm not the son of a farmer, but I know one thing. You don't thresh wheat in a wine press. That's like washing your clothes in the dishwasher. You see, when you thresh wheat, you need to be in an open place. So that when you thresh the wheat, the wind can come through and blow the chaff away. But in a wine press, you can be down in a cellar, in a, in a damp, dark, cold cellar. And I tell you, Threshing wheat in a cellar must be a miserable task because all the chaff would just fall with the wheat. What a gigantic mess you would have. But Gideon was in the cellar because he was afraid of the Midianites. And that is where God found this trembling coward. And God says to him in verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak Terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite. And his son Gideon was beating wheat in the winepress to hide from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, listen to this. The Lord is with you, O mighty man of fearless courage. Here's Gideon trembling out of fear, hiding in the cellar. And he hears the angel say to him, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of fearless courage. And at that point, if I was Gideon, I would make one of two conclusions. Either the angel is mocking me, or there's somebody else in the cellar. But it was neither. The angel was speaking to Gideon. My friends, aren't you glad this morning that God doesn't see you the way that you see yourself? In fact, he doesn't even see you the way that other people see you. Maybe your friends or your family members, they say to you, who do you think you are? We've known you since you were this big. 
we know what you're really made out of. My friends, listen to me. God sees you differently. And it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about you. It doesn't even matter what you think about you. It just matters what he thinks about you. And can I tell you what God sees when he looks at you? I believe with all my heart that when God looks at you, he sees what he envisioned when he was forming you in your mother's womb. At that moment when he was sewing you and knitting you together, he said, I'm going to make out of this woman a mighty woman of valor. He said, I'm going to make this man a healer and an evangelist and a preacher of the gospel. I'm going to make him bold as a lion. I'm going to make him a deliverer of my people. That's what God envisioned as he was creating you and all of your life. No matter what you do and no matter where you go, he still looks at you and he says, that's the one that's going to be my deliverer. And that's why God called Gideon the way he called him. Because God made Gideon to deliver the people of Israel. And the angel appeared and said, Gideon, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of fearless courage. And then listen to what Gideon says. In verse 13, Gideon said to him, O sir, if the Lord is with us, then why has all of this befallen us? And where are all of his wondrous works of which our fathers told us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. This is what Gideon was saying. He was saying, If what you're saying is true and the Lord is with us, then why don't we see miracles like we used to see? How come there's no Red Sea opening? How come there's no Jordan River opening? How come there's no plagues coming on the Midianites like they came on the Egyptians? And if the Lord is with us, where are the Moseses? Where are the Joshuas? Where are these great deliverers that, you, that once were in our land? I hear things like this today, honestly. I hear Christians talking like this. They say things like, where are the Smith Wigglesworths? Where are the John G. Lakes in our, in our time? Maybe here you say, where are the Reinhardt Bonkies? Where are these great men who have done great exploits? Where are God's great deliverers? And listen to what the angel of the Lord says to Gideon. This is going to amaze you. The Lord turned to him and said, go in this your might, and you shall save Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? My friends, this morning as you are asking the question in your heart, where are the Smith Wigglesworths? I hear the voice of the Lord reply back to you, I've chosen you. I want to use you. I want to put my anointing in you. I want to put my fire in you. I want to raise you up to do something great. My friends, stop looking around for some great deliverer or some great evangelist or some great prophet. The Lord wants to use you in your generation. And He's willing and He's able to fill you with His Holy Spirit if you're just willing to trust Him. And the Lord transformed Gideon from that trembling coward. I, I almost find it comical. Gideon tells his men when they have nothing to their advantage except clay pots and torches. 300 against a multitude of armed soldiers. And Gideon is so confident, he tells the soldiers, shout a sword for the Lord and mention me too. <laughs> a sword for the Lord and Gideon. The Lord transformed him as he will do to you this week in Jesus' name. One more thing I want to mention to you and then I'm gonna close. This is my third closing. I'm trying to be a good evangelist. <laughs> Look at the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. This is the story of when Isaiah was called into the ministry. Most of you know this. I want you to keep in the back of your minds that at this point in the life of Isaiah, where we read right now, Isaiah was not the great prophet that we all think about. He was just an average, ordinary guy. And then suddenly, one day, everything changed for him because he had an encounter with God. How many of you know an encounter with God will change your life? 
Look here at verse 1. It says that in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it there stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two they covered their face. With two they covered their feet. And with two they did fly. And one cried unto the other and said, Holy, 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 for the whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was sm filled with smoke. Imagine this. One day, you're Isaiah, and one day you're just sitting there watching television. It's an average, ordinary day. And then suddenly, you're caught up into the third heaven. And there you see the Almighty sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. His glory is so great that it's filling the temple. You see these gigantic angels stationed around the room. These angels are so big, they have six wings. And with their wings, they're covering their faces. They cannot even bring themselves to look upon this one who is so holy. And they cry to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The room is shaking. The posts of the door are moving. Smoke from the ground is rising. Do you think you might feel just a little bit uncomfortable? This was not Isaiah's natural habitat. And I imagine in that place, he must have felt about that big. And then there comes a question from the mouth of God. You read in the next verse, God says, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Whom shall I send and who will go for us? I'm sure that at that point, if I know human nature, Isaiah probably looked to one of those angels and said, Well, aren't you going to answer the call? And maybe one of those big seraphim looked at the other one and they shrugged their muscular shoulders. There's nothing we can do. And across the room he saw two more seraphim look at each other. Nothing we can do. Who can go? And then suddenly Isaiah realized something. The flesh and the blood, the weakness and the mortality that he thought was a disqualification is the one thing that made him the one candidate in that room that was acceptable and was sufficient to carry the message. Remember in Acts chapter 19, the angel came to Cornelius. But the angel was not allowed to preach the gospel to Cornelius. All the angel could say was send for Peter and he will tell you what you should do. Because you see the great privilege of the preaching of the gospel the great privilege of the carrying of the baton has not been entrusted into the mighty hands of celestial beings. But it has been entrusted to the frail, stammering lips of men and women like you and like me. And if we don't preach the gospel, my brothers and sisters, nobody will. Nobody will. But notice something else. Angel uh, Isaiah there replied to the Lord, as we all know, the famous missions text. He said, Lord, here am I, send me. But before that happened, something else happened to Isaiah. The Bible said that he suddenly had an awareness, a revelation of his unholiness before the Lord. And for a moment, maybe he thought that was a disqualifier, but something happened. The angel flew from the altar with live coals and touched his lips and his sin was purged his iniquity was taken away and he was usable for God back to our text in Hebrews in chapter 12 verse 1 it says wherefore we are seeing that we are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight and every sin that so easily besets us. 
My friend, holiness doesn't qualify you automatically. It's faith. I told you that already. But there are weights and there are sins that can so often beset us and hold us back and weigh us down and keep us from running that race. My friends, I hope that our generation will rise up in answer to the call of God and say, Lord, here am I, send me. But I hope that before the Holy Spirit falls tomorrow morning, we would all come to a place where we say, Lord, I'm going to lay down everything that's holding me back, everything that's keeping me from achieving what the fullness of my calling and running to the fullest of my potential. Every, every weight and every sin. Notice there's two things. Of course we know we need to repent of sins. And if, you, if you're living in sin this morning, I'm going to challenge you to repent. But there's some of us that it, maybe it's not a sin. It's a weight. Maybe it's okay for somebody else. You know, I was, I was dealing with something lately, and I felt the Holy Spirit convicting me about something. And I said, Lord, why are you convicting me about this? It's not a sin. And the Lord spoke to me. You want to know what he said? He said, others may, but you may not. And I sense that is what God is saying to a generation who needs to cross the finish line. We need to rise up, take the baton in our hand, and run with all of our might. Say amen. amen. If you want to answer that call of the Lord this morning, I want you to stand to your feet right now, all over this place. This morning, we are going to lay aside every weight and every sin that so easily besets us. And we're going to run the, with patience the race that is set before us. And we're going to say like Isaiah said, Here am I, Lord. Send me. Fill me. Use me. Anoint me. And make me dangerous. In Jesus' name. If that's you this morning, I just want you to close your eyes and lift your hands. And I want to lead you into prayer. Father, I thank you for every one of these men and women who have come here this morning, who have made themselves available, who have said, I want to be dangerous, I want to be risky, I want to be used by the Lord. Yes. Father, I pray that as you look down upon this waiting host, you would fill us with the Holy Ghost. Yes, that you would send the power of God upon our lives. Send the fire upon the altar that has been prepared and readied for the fire of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Just pray this with me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, this morning I come to you. I lay aside every weight. I lay aside every sin that so easily weighs me down. And this morning, Lord Jesus, let me run like the wind. Set me on fire. Use me for your glory. I yield to you. I surrender all. Take my life, Lord Jesus. Use me for your glory. Here am I. Send me. In Jesus' name. And everybody said.